African-American spirituality, there's a lot of singing. It brings in the ability to maintain hope in the darkest hours. I don't think you have to have any religious feelings whatsoever. I think you can be a, a stone atheist. It's more than religion. Cultural, we're all different faiths and races. It's amazing. No one looks like us, and no one sounds like us. The diversity, my goodness, singing, the, the, the singing, and the. Uh, one voice. Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir, they naturally assume it's all black because it's from Oakland. Not enough. Living in Oakland is cultural acceptance. Here you have a choir with up to 13, 14 different faiths represented of people who decide to get along, to celebrate instead of tolerate differences. Would I have met these people if I wasn't in the choir? Probably not. Each person in the choir has their own story. every Monday. Every time I walk in there, I say, why am I the lucky one? It's such a good feeling to sing. Just as long as I can eat, pay my bills. Doing music is what makes me happy.
Monday evenings, it's my church. When my parents say that when I was young, I would just sing, make up my own songs. If it was a three hour car ride, I would sing the whole three hours. I was looking for the call and response gospel sound. And a friend of mine had told me that the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir was a good choir. This choir for me is grace. There's just so much love and community and wonderful music that we get to share. There's a lot of roots here in Oakland for gospel. And the other thing is Terrence. My name is Terrence Kelly. I'm the artistic director for the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir, second generation Oakland musician. is thy faithfulness. This is my mom's piano. My dad had this piano made. We had two parents that played and did world-class music. We'd have concerts at home. I mean, good ones. never knew who was going to be walking around in the Kelly kids' house. There'd be rehearsals at the house, singers, professional people that my dad played with. My dad has a square over by the BART station in West Oakland that says Ed Kelly, jazz musician. As I look back and reflect, I see what a wonderful upbringing I had because I was poor. Who knew? My parents took such good care of us. You know, we were strictly brought up. Street light come on, better be within the sound of mom's voice at all times. We were always singing somewhere, and that came from my mom. My mom would teach me and my sisters all three parts. We were, we were not allowed to sing one. We had to sing all three. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Just to be a mediocre choir in Oakland is not good enough. Just to be a good choir in Oakland is not good enough. I want to be a great choir, an inspired choir. Oh, Jesus. 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 Oh, Jesus.
people. You have the Gospelettes, the Oakland Silvertones, the McDaniel Sisters, they still sing. And so, you know, you have all this going on in Oakland. The gospel music coming from Oakland, that was really the sound of Oakland. And it was something special, something different. In the early 60s, we were proud to be black, but still, you know, it seemed like the white folks had everything. And then James Brown came up with, said loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And then here comes Edwin Hawkins with, oh, happy day. And all of a sudden, we were walking around proud and black. Oh, happy day was the first gospel song I ever heard on Top 40 radio. The way it was arranged, I said, where'd this come from? I grew up here in Oakland, California, born right here. The gospel that I heard and the jazz that I heard certainly had a great influence on my beginnings of writings and all of that, but especially the gospel. The gospel music coming from Oakland, that sound was borrowed by everybody. It was the energy of it. It was the soul, but it was rock, it was everything. Terrence, I think, is one of the unique artists that we have from spirituals, from traditional gospel to contemporary. He does it all. And you don't have many gospel uh, choir directors in, throughout the country that, that can do that. I do what I do because I love to do it. I love to see people grow. I love to see people change. I love to see people wake up. Well, I guess you'd say the choir sprang out of jazz camp. In the beautiful mountains of Casadero, it's like the burning man of the jazz world. And there was Bobby McFerrin, Tuck and Patty, Andy Norell, on and on and on, these people that really actually weren't famous yet. Stacy and I had each gone to jazz camp. And one of the magic things about jazz camp was the gospel choir. Anybody could sing in it regardless of your background. I walked in the dining room, and there were these people singing gospel music. My jaw dropped. I'd never heard anything like that. I mean, I was a Jew from New York. What did I know about gospel music? And there was this woman. The director was Faye Kelly. Terrence's mother. I was always her assistant by virtue of the fact that I was at camp. In 1981, Faye died. A lot of my drive to teach a gospel choir came from my mom. People wanted to do it more than just a week. They wanted to sing gospel music throughout the year, but there was no other avenue readily available. Either Stacy said or I said or we both said, wouldn't it be great to keep a gospel choir going all year long? Everyone said, well, maybe Terrence can take it over. He's young, but he's gifted. You know, I wasn't sure, being a Christian boy, is it okay to do a gospel choir with people that are not Christian? My pastor at the time, Pastor Newton Carey, he's like, you know, if you do the choir for 100 years and you touch one person, it was worth it. 
So we started the Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir in March of 1986 with 23 members. You had people coming with no idea of what was gonna happen. So we had to forge a way because there was no example. I remember coming to my first rehearsal and not knowing a thing uh, other than the fact that maybe I could sing a little bit. When I came to United States, I was looking for a place where I could sing. I watched the movie, Sister Act Two, and then I fell in love with the music. That complicated harmony just hit me. He said, well, you have to sing and clap and rock. And I'm like, sing, clap, and rock. Things started happening. We started getting great press. Terrence, I think, always had confidence, but he was gaining more experience. We began having performance opportunities that were important. The challenges were who owned the choir. Some of the choir members themselves came to those of us that were running the program and said, we want to be our own identity. It was um, a little painful. And then I would say over a matter of weeks, personally for me, I got it, that it was perfect. Terrence is a devout Christian, and he made a decision to take gospel music, which still is true, but even more so then, has a sense of ownership within the church, that he was gonna bring that music into an interfaith world. There are some Christian churches right now we can't sing at because we're not all Christian. Oh Lord, here we go. We're neither nor, right? Right. So that means we have to be exemplary. You know, um, there are some black people that are gonna come to hear us where gospel is everything to them. To some of us, it's an art form, but to some of us, it's our history. It's who we are. So it's very serious business when you're singing gospel music. You walk into certain churches and you can see the, the, the prejudgment. Oh, they're not really gonna sing, so I'm just gonna sit back, you know. And then these people start singing and people perking up and standing up and it's the, the realness of it that, that breaks that mold. Lord kept me 
He held me, he held me close, and he saved my mind. He kept me, and I, I'm so glad. Yes, you'll wipe out if you tell your story, but you don't have a right to have this microphone and not. with a best friend and in the wrong place at the wrong time driving a guy opened fire and a uh, bullet went through the car door and into my leg. I'm here, I'm on two feet. So uh, it's, a, it's a very real praise. Whether I say Jesus, someone says I lie, someone may pray to the East several times a day, someone may go to church on Saturday, but they're expressing their praise. Interfaith, which means many faith, which also means many people, different skin color, different race color, it's, it's a big mix. It is the blend of culture, race, faith, ethnicity, it's all of that. We all are unconsciously absorbing messages about each other and particular groups of people without really realizing it. Personally, I do not care about the brand of God. It doesn't matter. The real thing is the essence. You're Buddhist? Fine. You're Christian? Fine. You don't know? Fine. If we discuss religion, our faith, we discuss it with the intent to inform, not to change. Since I'm Jewish, it was quite odd for me to be singing about Jesus at the outset. Jesus is real. As time went on, the spirit of the music became more universal for me. I'm born and raised in Oakland, and it opened me up to the amazing richness and power in African-American music and African-American culture. Jesus is real. So here is the house I grew up in. That bedroom back there, if it had been a stressful day, I'd just go in there, crank up music, and sing along. for a good black gospel choir that I could somehow be part of. And it enabled me to have the diversity that I think I, I was seeking. Oakland Interfaith Gospel Choir sings spirituals regularly because there's no American music unless it's indigenous people's First Nations music that doesn't come out of the Negro spiritual or the work song.
we sang the music that birthed many other styles of music. Spirituals, work songs, and slave songs freed the slaves. So I am adamant about keeping them alive. Gospel music came out of the Negro spiritual. Christianity was forced on the African. So they found a way to include their past religion into their present religion. They taught themselves to sing the hymns of the white church, which was being forced upon them because it was a way to sing out pain, to, to sing in their joy. Spirituals were developed because we wanted our freedom. And then from the spirituals then was developed gospel music. It started with people breaking the bonds of this narrow hymn base. And that became the forefront of gospel as we know it today. Now let us sing to the power of the Lord. Just look at us, you know. We sing new girl spirituals. We're one third black. <laughs> and so that's very different. And I've realized that that's a little unsettling for some people, that they, well, you know, you guys are not all black, and you're singing Negro spirituals. You know, when he's directing, he will often tell us that we sound too white. And there's something wonderfully, deliciously subversive about that. It really turns this trope on the head of hundreds of years of the white community telling the black community that they sound wrong. The next song we're going to sing is from the perspective of an African-American slave woman. It says, how come me here? There's no freedom here. They treat me so mean here. Lord, how come me here? They treat me so, so mean here, Lord. They treat me so, 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 so mean. They treat me. African-Americans used music to tell many stories, to lead people on the railroad. Imagine no lights, no cars, 
no buses, how much further the voice would carry. Each time I sing that song, Lord, how come me here? I believe I channel something different, something that I didn't access before. I'm a social worker. The youth I primarily work with, a lot of times the trauma of being removed from their families causes different mental health issues. What I've come to learn and to know as a woman and now as a mom, in many cases, these parents are just like the woman in the song, where you feel you have no choice. Your back is against the wall. Oakland, inner city America, is going through gentrification. The rents are going up exponentially in a way where the average citizen of the city can no longer afford to stay in the city. What happens is you lose a lot of people of color and you have big culture clashes. Local churches are facing criticism. Are the worshipers being too loud? Taylor Memorial Baptist Church was over 130 years old. They were threatened with incremental fines if they didn't bring their noise level down. You know, you're in the middle of service and here come some police officers. But because you moved into the neighborhood, I now have to be silent.
The black church has been the gathering place for black people for centuries here in the, in the United States. During the Civil Rights Movement, those songs from the black church became marching orders and war cry. When the Black Panthers were most active in the early 70s, they just sang church songs. They just sang harder. You know, we shall overcome, I shall not be moved, wade in the water. A lot of those songs became slavery, railroad anthems, and thusly, in the 60s, they turned into civil rights anthems as well. At that time, as now, the black church was a sanctuary. The feeling of sanctuary is being reestablished in the black community, and that is that feeling of we come here to be honest in a way that we can't be honest anywhere else. We can come here and talk about it. It's, it's a scary time for an ethnic person in the United States right now. There is a need for some sort of hope. Getting back to that place of forming safe communities. So you always go back to your roots during time of trouble. We've all heard our grandmothers and mothers singing, humming something, and it's, it's, it's a spiritual. But the spirituals are basically what got us through, what gave us strength during bad times. I try to give myself a little time so I don't come in with my adrenaline pumping. And my shift starts at 2,300 hours, and it'll go to 0, 0,700 hours tomorrow morning. I work as dispatch for the Oakland Fire Department. We get calls transferred from the police department for assault and things like that. No. You don't get closure from this job. You did your best to send the help as quick as you could and then just, and then letting go. We have a cause. We want to bring this music to the people who need it. We want to share it with those in need. We want to inspire and incite hope. Because when we sing and we go to the jails and, and the rest homes and the places that we go, we hope to inspire one person to get them through the next day or that evening. That's our message. Once again, we're coming together to sing here and sing for these ladies and gentlemen who are incarcerated and we want to sing for them like we're singing for the Pope or the President. 
We bring love. We bring love. We bring joy. We bring joy. We bring peace. We bring peace. We bring healing. We bring healing. We bring forgiveness. We bring forgiveness. We send love. We send love. We send joy. We send joy. We send peace. We send peace. We send peace. We send peace. We send love. We send love. Everybody hug two people and line up. by singing to the people that need it. There was no politics going on, race, boundary, or any of that. We stepped out of that for a while. Everybody was sad at first, but after hearing that, everybody pretty much was smiling. for decades and the fact that we are able to go just feels like kind of a long time dream. So it was like a collective effort of people to bring the unity of Oakland to another country. <laughs> Restoration. Energy. Mm. Joy. Love. Peace. for us singing gospel. And the way they were tuned in and listening intently was one of the largest highlights for me because it really showed me on a global level how impactful gospel music really is. talking about roots tonight. This is where our music comes from, you know, and developing different, different motions and different expressions that they have their common roots.
they sound like angels. These people can sing. Tears left after the night, man. They're getting, they're killing me. They're killing me. between races right now it's not new but our country and the world needs to see that people that are not alike can do something together do something beautiful together do something healing together and then separate.
work Monday through Fridays till at least 2 a.m. My priority in life wasn't about making money. It's about life's experience. And this choir gives me so many experiences. Each time we sing is a life moment I'll, I remember. I, I remember. Terrence said it's going to work. And usually when he says that, it, it does. So when it came time for us to choose a spot to get married, we I think we just took a trip up here one day, right, and just kind of walked through and looked for a spot. Yeah. We found a little picnic area called Old Church. There was a point where the choir really wasn't ready to say publicly that we had LGBTQ people in the choir. And then through the years, I think we've all grown to realize how to be part of a group like this. I hid who I was for many years. I don't hide anything anymore. This year will be 10 years with my partner, Atri. 10 years. <laughs> Atri and I are the godparents to her kids. They ushered my baby in, and you know, it's just a wonderful family. This choir is my way of protesting and speaking out and demonstrating what we should look like, what this country should look like. Then I'll stand in as long as I can, as long as Terrence will have me, as long as I have a voice to sing. If we weren't here together, we might not know each other, we might not even like each other. But when we do this together, we love each other. When you have love, you can have peace. You can have empathy. You can have patience. You can have some of the things that are necessary for people who are very different to come together. You can turn some tragedy into a triumph. That's a different kind of choir. Yeah.